Well, thank you everybody for joining us today um, for the uh, next webinar in our series on livestock guardian dogs. Oh, I do want to thank a few people um, before I turn it over to Dr. Lord. Um, oh, I want to thank our, our center director, Dr. Redden, uh, for providing leadership for our program here. Uh, the Sheep and Goat Predator Management Board for providing funding for my program. And then also Robert Pritz, uh, as always, uh, you know, he's the guy that takes care of all the Zoom stuff for us and, and getting everything set up for our webinar. So um, thank you to everybody. I also want to um, I'll con or I also want to thank our sponsor, uh, Lone Star Tracking. Uh, if you're looking for any type of GPS trackers, uh, you know, go ahead and reach out to Thomas Remark at Lone Star Tracking, and, and he'll get you set up. Uh, if you have any specific questions, feel free to contact me here at the center, and I can try and help you out with those GPS tracker stuff. Uh, Dr. Catherine Lord's joining us again um, all this month. Uh, she's a postdoctoral associate in the Carlson Lab at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. Uh, her main interest is in the evolutionary development of animal behavior and its application to management of domestic and wild species. Uh, Dr. Lord received her PhD from the University of Massachusetts in organism organismic and evolutionary biology uh, with Dr. Raymond Coppinger. Uh, her dissertation examined developmental explanations for major behavioral differences between wolves, dogs, and breeds thereof. Uh, her research and publications have focused on the evolution, uh, development, and genetics of dogs and wolf behavior. Uh, her work has been published in professional journals, including Animal Behavior, Behavioral Processes, um, Trends in Ecology, and Evolution and Science. She's served as a faculty at Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts. Also, uh, hopefully I say this one right, Dr. Lord, uh, Canisius College in Canisius, Buffalo, New York. Canisius, yeah. Canisius, Canisius yeah in Buffalo, New York, and the Gettysburg College in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, you can find her um, all with her Google Scholar profile, uh, which has a list of all her publications. And she's also, um, she can be found at the carlsonlab.org uh, website um, where she works as well. So again, thank you, Dr. Lord, for um, coming and joining us again. I know we had a lot of folks uh, very interested um, in having you come back and speak again. So um, with that, I will, um, oh, one quick uh, housekeeping, if anybody's new on our webinars, um, if you'll just post your questions in the chat, and then uh, we'll get to those at the end of uh, the presentation today. So um, go ahead, Dr. Lord. Thank you very much, ma'am. Great. Thanks so much for having me, Bill. Um, and uh, this time around, I'm going to be talking about the development of predatory behavior in dogs. So just to start off um, a little bit about why that topic. Um, so we use a lot of different types of dogs for different jobs. Um, and this is because different working lines have been bred to show different behaviors. So a good livestock guarding dog, for example, is not going to also make a good retriever and vice versa. A good retriever is not going to make a good livestock guarding dog. Um, but, but I'm interested in why that is and where those differences come from. So um, the behaviors that are important in many of the working lines are actually derived from um, ancestral wolf predatory behavior. And by leaving out certain key components of the functional uh, predatory behavior, we can get things like herding or um, Schutzen behaviors like in police dogs or pointing or retrieving or livestock gardening dogs um, and many other useful behaviors. So while people have been breeding for these behaviors for a long time by taking the best working dogs and breeding them to the best working dogs and then raising them with particular experiences, we actually still don't precisely understand how that behavior develops at a biological level. So I study, as Bill mentioned, the evolution and development of behavior using wolves and dogs as a model. And I find these differences in working lines really interesting, not just because they help us better understand these behaviors um, and allow us to potentially breed and raise better working dogs, but also because this sort of behavioral variation is the perfect system to better understand the very complex interactions between genes and environment that lead to the evolution of behavior on a broader scale. So today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, um, first, about what we know about 
the development of predatory behaviors. And so I'm going to start this out very broadly by talking about um, evolution and what that is, um, which will be a little bit of a review if you saw my last talk, but it's important. And then I'm going to talk to you about how we study the evolution of behavior in general, um, and then talk to you about wolf predatory behaviors, and then what we know about dog predatory behaviors and how both of those develop. Um, and then I'm gonna switch over to what we wanna know and what we're trying to figure out on our current hypothesis and how we're going to test that. So to start, um, dogs did not start out as hunting or herding or guard dogs. They started out as animals that adapted to survive off of our garbage and refuse. And so what do I mean by they evolved to adapt to this particular environment? Well, um, evolution really just means change over time. And so that can happen randomly to a population or it can happen through natural selection. I think my, just can move this over. There we go. It can happen through uh, natural selection. So first let's talk about the random version. So change in a population can happen randomly um, through things like uh, bottleneck, which means you have some population, like this population of butterflies, where you have variation in traits, like in this case, we have variation in wing color. And then through some usually natural disaster, there's a big die off in the population. And in this case, we had a big die off and we went from having two wing colors to just yellow wing colors. But having yellow wings didn't help these butterflies survive the natural disaster. Let's say it's a hurricane. They just randomly happened to survive. And so now the population has changed to having all yellow wings, but that doesn't have anything to do with them being able to survive better. It's just completely random. Um, and so we can have something similar occur if we have some subgroup of a population leave the area they're in and start their own new population. So now we have yellow and green butterflies and a few butterflies go off to a new meadow and start their own new population. And it just so happens that those butterflies are all green. And so the population they start is going to be all green, but had had nothing to do with their wing color it was just completely random chance that they were the ones that started out that population. So whenever we have changes in a population that doesn't have to do with their survivability, then it, we, we just say that's random evolution. But there's another kind of evolution that you're probably more familiar with, which is natural selection. And in this case, um, we have several things that must be true for natural selection to work. One is that within the population, we can't have every individual survive. And this is generally the case because usually there's just not enough food for everybody to survive and reproduce and keep going. Eventually they will um, starve if that happened. So um, every individual cannot survive. Then the second thing is that there needs to be some kind of variation in the population. For example, in the picture here, we have variation in coat color in our in our fawns here. Um, so there needs to be some sort of standing variation. And uh, the offspring need to get that variation from that their parents. So it needs to be passed on. It needs to have some genetic um, underpinning so that it can be passed on from one generation to the next. And then finally, some of those traits need to be beneficial. And what we mean by beneficial in evolutionarily speaking is that it helps them to survive and reproduce and contribute to the next generation. So when we have all of these things, we get something, uh, we can get natural selection. So we can imagine in this deer population, we have a situation where not everybody could survive. Um, there's variation with our coat color. And we're going to say that this coat color variation is passed on from the parents and that um, we can imagine that some of this, these coat colors could be beneficial. So let's say if you're a darker coat color, you're better able to hide in the shadows from predators, more likely to survive and reproduce. So of those individuals that um, in that population, some of them are gonna survive, but if you have that darker coat color, color, you'll be more likely to be one of the individuals that does survive, reproduce and passes on that darker coat color. So over time, 
the change in coat color will be towards more and more dark animals until you have all animals with dark coat colors. And that would then be an adaptation to the environment that they're in um, now. So that's how we get those adaptations. Um, so if we go back to our, our wolves for a moment, wolves have adapted a foraging behavior that allows them to be very successful, meaning survive and reproduce, by hunting large ungulates, large hoofed animals. Um, and so, so this is natural selection, but for a long time, no one actually studied the evolution of behavior. They studied the evolution of morphological traits like coat color or leg length, um, because it's easy to measure those things. I can look at uh, animal bones and measure how long they are, or I can look at a coat and see what color it is. But people had a really hard time figuring out how on earth we were going to measure behavior and figure out how those traits were um, changing over time. So um, in uh, finally, uh, at the beginning of animal behavior, the field itself, there were a group of people called the ethologists and they thought, yes, and behavior could evolve and they came up with the traits to look at and we call those motor patterns. Motor patterns, you can think of them sort of like um, just freeze frames of an animal behaving. It's like just a, a, a quick moment in time. Um, but these, but these uh, positions that animals take also need to have a, a genetic component. And the way they figured out that was that these, these motor patterns show up perfectly when the animal performs them the first time. They don't change over time. They're just there and they're, they're good to go. So some examples from wolves are orient. You'll see on the left here, the head is up above the level of the shoulders. The ears are up and the eyes, ears, and nose are all focused in on a potential prey item. This is really well demonstrated if you've ever seen the animated movie Up and all the dogs are going squirrel whenever they say squirrel and they perk up, that's orient. That is that motor pattern. Um, so next to it, we have actually two motor patterns on the right here. The first one refers to the position of the head again. Now the head is dropped to the level of the shoulders or potentially below the shoulders. The ears are going forward or out to the side and the eyes, ears and nose are all still focused on that potential prey item. The other motor pattern here is stalk which is the body position, the legs are bent and the animal is either creeping forward slowly or frozen stock still. So all of these motor patterns are actually part of the wolf's foraging behavior. The full functional sequence makes up this behavior, includes orients, then eye stalk, then chase, which is exactly what it sounds like, then grab bite, which is the initial bite to the prey animal. And this is, if this is on a large animal, it's usually just whatever they can grab first, a leg, a rump, something like that. Um, then kill bite, I don't have a picture here of that. Um, but in the canids, the kill bite is a bleeding bite. So usually to a major vein or artery, often the jugular. Um, it's interesting across the carnivores, you can often identify the kill by the kill bite. So in a can in a canid, it's a bleeding bite, but in a in a felid, it's a, actually a suffocating bite. So they're actually crushing the windpipe. They're directing it to another place. Um, and then finally, the dissecting bite, which is pulling apart the uh, animal to eat. I should mention because it always comes up that there are substitutions in the wolf for smaller prey because they will all also hunt medium sized uh, mammals. And occasionally you'll see pups uh, going after smaller prey like this one. Um, and so the substitutions are, they start, they still start out with Orient, but they um, substitute in a mouse, a, a mouse pounce, which is down here on the bottom. You can see the end of one, it's not the best picture, but basically they launch themselves up in the air and they land on the prey with their front two feet, pinning it. Then they go to the grab bite, same, same as the larger prey. But because they're grabbing the whole thing usually in their mouth or a large portion of it, it it's not really, um, they can't really get in a kill bite. They can't really focus it on a specific area. So instead they head shake, which breaks the neck of the animal. Um, in the case of this picture, this is a pup and he's actually head shaked this bull so hard that he threw it in the air. So that's the substitutions um, for smaller prey. So now that we have these motor patterns, 
how do we measure them? Um, and there's a number of ways we can do that. The first is the quality of the motor pattern, which is what I've been describing to you, the shape that the motor pattern is. But we can also look at frequency. So that's how often um, an animal is performing that motor pattern. We can look at context. When, when are they? What are they um, performing it towards? And then duration. How long do they perform each of these motor patterns for? threshold, which is closely related and it's slightly confusing in that threshold is basically the the um, how extreme the stimulus needs to be to get the animal to perform the motor pattern. So for example, you might um, think of an animal going from that stalk to chase. Um, and so that that might have to do with um, how much the prey animal moves. And so if the animal, if they just need a little bit of movement, that would be a very low threshold. If the other man, animal twitches and they go after them, that would be a low threshold. But if they really need the other animal to really run for it before they can start chasing, that would be a high threshold. Um, and finally, sequence, which is uh, just like what I was showing you there, what motor patterns come before and after the motor pattern of interest. So we can measure all of those things just like we would measure the length of a bone or something like that. And in that way, see how it's evolving. So um, I'm just gonna check in and make sure there's nobody's lost um, at this point. Uh, just real quick, make sure there's no questions there. Okay, great. Um, all right, so, whoops. So, um, Going back to our wolves and dogs, um, while wolves have adapted their foraging behavior to uh, survive by hunting large ungulates, dogs have adapted their foraging behavior to be very successful, meaning survive and reproduce, scavenging human waste. And so that's what dogs first evolved to do. And in fact, that's what most of the world's dogs are still doing. So there's about a billion dogs on the planet and upwards of 84% of them are still living in this garbage dump like niche. So scavenging off of our, our refuse and waste. Um, and they do really, really well at it. They're very well adapted to it. They um, survive so well that even when we try to cull them and get rid of them um, in areas where they're say producing zoonotic diseases and things like that, we do not do it well. We cannot get rid of them. So they are extremely successful. Um, so because of this though, you don't really need to orient eye stalk chase, grab bite, kill bite a, um, a rotten melon to eat it. You just need to walk up to it and eat it. So they don't need any of these fancy motor patterns to forage anymore. And so they lost them. Um, and what I mean when I say they've lost them isn't that they're, they no longer can perform them, but that the threshold on those motor patterns is so high that you rarely ever see them. So basically they need such an extreme stimulus to trigger that motor pattern that it's unlikely to occur in their lifetime. Um, this, people think about this a lot with dogs biting. Um, so everybody says all dogs can bite. And so the difference between how likely it is a dog will bite is that threshold, right? So if they have a very low threshold, they're probably gonna bite a person. Um, it's gonna be, they're a fairly dangerous dog but all dogs have some threshold at which if you do cross it, they will bite. Um, it's just that uh, most dogs who live in our homes have a fairly high threshold. So you'd have to really push them hard before they would bite. Um, and so it's the same thing with the, with the foraging behaviors in these village dogs. It's probably in there somewhere, but um, it's really buried deep. It's hard to get them to perform those motor patterns. And we can imagine also that especially a kill bite would be very strongly selected against in the early evolution of dogs. Because if you had these animals getting closer and closer to human settlements and they were any danger to humans, they'd probably be um, eliminated really quickly. Uh, so kill bite particularly um, is, is not seen in dogs. But after we had these dogs in existence, once they became dogs, they got closer and closer to people. And some of them started to get closer to homes out, out of the garbage dump and in closer to the homes, maybe getting 
direct handouts from people near their homes. And at some point, people decided they could that these dogs could be useful for something now that they were dogs. Um, and the earliest jobs we probably used dogs for were uh, things like livestock guarding that didn't involve uh, the use of predatory motor patterns where we don't want predatory motor patterns involved. We've gotten rid of those. And so having a dog that will sit in the field with the livestock and not chase them, but just bark at predators would be great. Um, and you could see that happening pretty early on. Another option, um, there are in uh, current subsistence uh, tribes, you sometimes have dogs who hunt, but they aren't using any of their predatory uh, ancestral predatory motor patterns. Instead, they're basically just running around in the woods and when they smell something in the ground, they bark at it and let the person know it's there. So that kind of hunting where they're not actually doing any hunting, they're just sort of identifying where the animal is and getting very excited about it, could be some of these earlier jobs um, that didn't involve any real special behaviors. Um, and But once we had those dogs, working with us, then we could start to have some selection for specific motor patterns that were in the ancestral wolf um, behavior. And so we do see that in modern breeds. I'm not sure what happened with these pictures. Hang on. I think they're going to come in individually. Okay, great. Um, so we do have these in modern breeds. So for example, the retriever um, has orient chase and grab bite but he skips eye stalk altogether um, and no kill bite either. Kill bite's not great. Oh, we don't want that. So um, they also have grab bite uh, hypertrophied, which means they do it even, they really like to grab bite. Um, so if you have a retriever around, especially a working light retriever, they really like stuff in their mouth, they like to hold things in their mouth, that's grab bite. Um, so it's actually been escalated in that particular breed. Um, Whereas if we have a herding dog, um, we actually have a couple of different kinds of herding dogs, but if we look at say the border collie, they have orients, they have a hypertrophied eye stalk and chase. They do have grab bite, but it isn't as tightly um, attached to the other parts of the sequence. So in a wolf, they have to perform that sequence I told you, orient, eye stalk, chase, grab, bite. It has to be in that order. If they can't chase, they can't grab, bite. If they can't eye stalk, they can't chase. It has to be in that order. And if it's interrupted, they have to start over again from the beginning with the exception of dissecting bite, which isn't entirely connected. They can go back to something that's already dead and dissect it, which is how they can scavenge. Um, some feline um, predators are even more stuck in their, um, in their sequences. So uh, for example, cheetahs, if they get interrupted, um, they can't even eat their prey uh, if they've killed it. So if somebody comes up in a Jeep after they killed their um, prey and scares them off, when they come back, they can't eat it because that dissecting bite is attached to the kill bite and they can't do it without having just killed it. So um, in, in those, those animals, those sequences are very locked in. Uh, in dogs, it's less so. They can bounce around a bit more. And we also have these these sort of changed thresholds like in the border collie where the threshold for grab bite is pretty high. And for that, the stimulus is that you have to have chased for long enough. So if you chase for a long enough time, they eventually will go into the grab bite and they're close enough to whatever it is. But if they get close enough to whatever it is after too short a period, they'll just run right past it. They won't grab bite. Um, and, and this is really useful when you're herding uh, sheep because you wanna really easily be able to have that interrupt that sequence and have the dog lie down before he gets to the grab bite. But you might want a little bite occasionally to get the sheep moving. Um, so having that high threshold is useful um, and then no kill bite. And then of course our livestock guarding dogs, we don't want any of those predatory motor patterns. And that is key in having a dog who's, who's safe to be left with the uh, livestock without harassing them um, or potentially killing them. Uh, so we don't want any of those motor patterns. Orient would probably be okay, um, but nothing else is any good. So, and again, it doesn't mean they aren't there. It just means that the threshold is so high that we aren't seeing it. Um, we do get dissecting bites sometimes in livestock guarding dogs and that's okay too, except sometimes people get upset. So 
if, for example, a, uh, a lamb is killed by a predator and the dog chases it off, but there's a dead lamb there and the dog has dissecting bite, it will eat the lamb. If it doesn't have dissecting bite, it will sit next to the lamb and look pitiful, um, which we often take to mean that they are protecting the lamb still, but really they're just waiting for someone to open the darn thing up so they can eat it. Um, so it tends to look bad when they have dissecting bite, but there's no reason it should hurt their ability to guard the livestock. Um, so we get all the same motor patterns in dogs that we have in wolves, but they have different rules. So all of those things like frequency and context and duration and threshold, all of those have been mixed up in the dogs. Um, and so that is what seems to have changed. So how did that happen is really what I'm interested in. How on earth do we get that kind of change through evolution? Um, what is the mechanism that's, that's allowing that to happen? So the first place we can look is where do we first see these motor patterns? As I mentioned, the motor patterns should show up because they're motor patterns, they should show up perfectly the first time they occur. So we should be able to look back in development and say, okay, when do we see the motor patterns the first time? So if we go back to the very beginning of their lives, both dogs and wolves have a completely different foraging motor pattern sequence when they're born. It's the same one. It's the same one all mammals have. And that is because when they're born, these wolves are not adapted to hunt undulates when they're born and dogs are not adapted to scavenge when they're born. Both are adapted to mom, to suckle on mom. That is all they are adapted for. So because of that, they have the same behavior and that foraging sequence also starts with orient, but because they are born without the ability to see, hear or smell, this orient is a different behavior. It's guided by heat. And so they're just following a heat gradient. So that means wherever it's warmer, they go towards that until they reach um, mom, hopefully. Sometimes it's a hot water bottle or a brother or a sister, but hopefully it's mom. Um, at which point they'll start swinging their heads back and forth. And we call that rooting. When they hit a nipple, they attach with their mouth. And then at the same time, they'll suckle and tread with their feet. So that sequence, they're born with that. That comes all packaged together. All the rules are already there. Um, it doesn't, doesn't have to do anything to, to, to make it work. If they aren't allowed to perform it, it will start to fall apart. But otherwise, they, they have that sequence and they're ready to go. So we don't start to see the adult motor patterns until the primary critical period of socialization. So if you saw my last talk, I talked a lot about this period. All I'm going to say right now is it's a time period early in the life of both dogs and wolves and all mammals and birds, in fact, where the brain is increasing really rapidly and a lot of um, crucial adult behaviors are forming. And so this is also when we start to see the appearance of adult motor patterns of all kinds. And so something really cool happens during this time. I'm just gonna call it the juvenile period in general, just to give it a little more vagary um, uh, than the critical period, but it's really the same time. Um, and so at this time, what happens is all of those new natal motor patterns like that foraging behavior I told you about, those start to turn off. And what I mean by that is that instead that sequence starts to fall to pieces. So they can still perform the motor patterns, but they no longer need to be in sequence. So for um, a newborn animal, they have to root before they attach. They have to suckle to tread. They have to do all of those things just like the adult wolf. It has to be in that sequence. Um, but as they get older, the sequence starts to get a little loosey-goosey. They don't necessarily have to orient in order to root. So they don't have to even root to attach. They can just grab onto a bottle if they're being bottle fed and it, it gets much easier. Um, but they'll also be able to perform those motor patterns out of context. So they can suckle on their foot or they can, you know, throw it in the middle of a bunch of other behaviors that doesn't have to be in the same sequence. So all of the rules that were associated with that, with that motor pattern sequence start to dissolve and fall apart. And at the same time, 
the adult motor patterns turn on, but they also don't have any of their rules associated with them. They just show up individually and you'll just get a random adult uh, motor pattern. You'll just suddenly get a grab bite. That's a very popular early one um, uh, out, of, out of the blue in the middle of nothing. And so what happens during this time, during the primary critical period of socialization is that you get a mixing of motor patterns, a little, just a, a smorgasbord of motor patterns and the pup will mix them up together and experiment with them and find different sequences. And when they find one that's rewarding, they'll do it again and again and again, a game sort of, so to speak. So, so they find a group of motor patterns they like together and they keep doing that. And what we call this um, colloquially is play. And so that's all that is going on during play. And I'm gonna show you a little movie because I'm sure you've all seen Pops play before, but you might not have been thinking about it in this way. So um, these, this, this is a litter of uh, Border Collie Pups. Um, and I want you to watch this one in the back. I don't know if you can see my uh, cursor, but there's a pup in the back left with his tail up um, next to the basket. We're gonna be watching him. I'm gonna walk you through the motor patterns that he is performing as he performs them. So. We're gonna start with a little grab bite on the basket, a couple of them. Then we're gonna do a little mouse pounce, grab bite, brother, back down, mouse pounce, grab bite. Then we're gonna kind of shuffle along for a second. Mouse pounce, mouse pounce, chase your tail and lie down. So he's just shuffling all of those motor patterns together. People usually want me to replay that. So I'm just gonna run it again without telling you what's going on. So you can see again, the motor patterns. Okay, so that's play. So they shuffle all those motor patterns together and come up with this wacky behavior. And so now we're gonna go into the hypothesis part of this talk. So everything I've been telling you before is stuff we know. This is now something we're trying to figure out. Um, because they do this, it has developed uh, an interesting hypothesis about how these motor patterns then get synced up into the sequences we see in our different uh, our different um, working lines. So the hypothesis is that the more a pup expresses a motor pattern during this critical period during play, the more likely it will be included in the adult repertoire. So the more they do it, the more likely they can shuffle it into that experimental variety and find some combination that they find rewarding and use it over and over again. And then the more likely that will continue on into the adult. And so there's a couple different ways we can get motor patterns to be expressed more. Uh, one of them is through environment. So if you have an environment that encourages the expression of that motor pattern, the pup will be able to do it more. So for example, if the pup has something that they can um, chase, they're more likely to show chase more. Um, if they have something they can grab bite, they're more likely to grab bite more. Now, of course, the pup, if they really want to perform these motor patterns, could always do it to themselves, chase their own tails, bite their own tails, things like that. So this isn't entirely um, exclusive, but it is, it is the case that we can produce an environment that encourages the expression of certain motor patterns. But the other way we can increase the expression of motor patterns is through genetics. And basically the, the timing of when they start showing the motor pattern during that critical period, during that juvenile period. So the earlier the motor pattern turns on during this period, the more time they have to sequence it into a, um, a fun sequence that they like to do over and over again, and the more likely they'll use it more. The later it turns on, potentially the harder it is to sequence into those already existing groups of motor patterns and the more likely it will just fall away and not be expressed. So in order to determine if this is true, um, I actually did do a little pilot study long ago when I was a grad student um, looking at 11 wolves, uh, 13 working line border collies and 28 uh, Schutzen German Shepherd um, 
pups uh, from the ages of two to nine weeks. And in order to do that measurement I was talking about, we need to do something called coding behavior. And when you code behavior, you're basically, um, these days, it's usually watching a video or watching the pups live. And then on a computer, you're hitting a button every time you see a given behavior. So every time you see grab bite or, 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 um, or chase or eye or stock, you hit a button. And the computer program then takes, uh, takes that information and calculates frequency, uh, duration, sequence, all of those things. So um, I did that with these pups for two hours a day between two to nine weeks of age. Each pup, I recorded their behavior for two 15 minutes chunks during that two hours. Um, and so what I expected was that I would be able to then say, okay, so wolves will show these motor patterns at some time point during this critical period when it is early enough for that motor pattern to become effectively sequenced in and become the functional behavior. So the wolves are sort of our, our um, yardstick, so to speak, of where you need to have that motor pattern turn on in order for it to be functional, in order for it to show up in the adult. And so this is just hypothetical. We have these Ws placed across this timeline when the wolf would show grab bite fairly early, the chase, eye stalk, and orient. And then we could look at the German shepherds who should show orient. And we'd expect if they were gonna show orient as an adult, they should at least show it when the wolves show it. They could show it earlier, but they need to show it at least by when the wolves are showing it. Now I, which we don't expect to see in the Schutz and German shepherds, we expect them to just show orient and then go straight to chase and grab bite much like a retriever. Um, we'd expect I to show up later in during this period than in a wolf because we don't think it's going to be included in the adult repertoire. Same thing with stock. But chase, German shepherds show on a hypertrophy level. So we'd expect that to be earlier than the wolves because it should be even more than the wolves. And same with grab bite. Um, the border collies also show orient, but they show eye and stock as well. So we'd expect their eye and stock to show up at least by the time the wolves show it, possibly earlier. Same thing with chase. We'd expect that to be earlier because it's hypertrophied. And grab bite, we'd expect to be at the same time as wolves, um, but because it's um, it's still there, even though it's not extreme. And so the data that I got did support this in some ways and not in others. So if we look across here, orient at the bottom, we see wolves are in black and German shepherds are in red and border collies are in blue. We see that border collies and German shepherds are showing orient before wolves and they have it both have it in their sequence. So that makes sense. Same thing with grab bite, although we might not have expected the border collies to show it so early, but they do. Um, same thing with chase. We expected both of them to show it well before the wolves and they do. But when we get to eye and stock, things become a little less clear. The border collies are showing it uh, at around the same time as the wolves, not significantly different. The German shepherds are showing it after the wolves, although because we had such small numbers, they're not significantly different from the wolves and they're definitely not significantly different from the border collies. And that's not what we'd expect. Um, this, this, this is encouraging, but it doesn't really tell us whether we're right or not because we could have had a couple issues here. One is we have a kind of small sample size. So it might not be enough to let us know that a difference is there even when it is. Um, statistically. And the other is the way that I coded the behavior, which is I was looking at 15 minute chunks out of two hour chunks. And um, when I was watching the pups, it was quite clear that the play when I and stock was included was different between the border collies and German shepherds. So when the border collies were playing with I stock, everybody I stocked, and it was just a whole two hour party of I and stock. And if I coded a pup during that playtime, then they got a bunch of eye stock recorded. But if I recorded them a little bit later than they were sleeping, they didn't get any. Um, whereas the German Shepherd sort of sprinkled eye and stock in sparsely throughout play, I was more likely to catch it in the different pups. So really what I needed to do was to be coding a longer period of time, looking for every play incidents there was. But 
coding is a lot, takes a lot of time. And not only do you have to go through each movie and code what happens in real time, you then have to get another person to do it to make sure you're something called reliable, which just means that they agree that they saw the same thing. And this helps um, us from unconsciously skewing the data. So if I'm expecting some result, I might um, hit the button, hit a button or not hit a button subconsciously based on what I'm expecting. Um, I know I tend to actually skew it against myself, but that's bad too, right? If I'm expecting something happen and I'm worried that I'm seeing it happen, so I don't hit it, that's just as bad. So I need somebody else who has no idea what we're doing to code the behavior and say, yes, I agree that we saw the same thing. Um, and so that takes even longer because then they have to be trained and then they have to code a bunch of data. So this is thousands of hours of video. And so um, and so it kind of stayed there for a long time. But now we're going to start doing this again because there's new technology that allows us to get um, better data. So what we're planning on doing is recording litters with Nest Cams 24-7. And so we'll get video from uh, the beginning of the critical period through the end of the critical period nonstop. We'll have all of their play. Then, in order to fix this problem of it takes a long time to code behavior, we're going to actually do something called gamify um, uh, coding. And so what this means is we're going to turn uh, coding into a uh, game you can play on your phone where people will be able to watch one minute clips of pops. They'll have one particular pop highlighted that they're watching. And then they'll have one behavior. And so if they see the pup grab bite, for example, they'll hit a button at the bottom of the screen that says grab bite, and it will register that the pup has bit, um, or they might have chase, or they might have eye, but they'll only have one. And they can watch as many videos as they want. And we'll get thousands of people to do this. So they'll basically check each other's reliability by seeing if they agree or not. You might have some outliers um, who are just hitting it all the time or never hitting it. And then, but our majority of people should agree. And in this way, we'll be able to say, aha, this pup started showing this behavior at this date, uh, at this age. Then we're going to follow these pups to adulthood. They'll all be working line. So we're going to have three different working line groups. One of them is definitely going to be livestock guarding dogs because livestock guarding dogs are the most different of the working lines because they shouldn't have any of these motor patterns. So um, we'll follow them into adulthood and see what they're doing as adults. Are they successful at their job and what motor patterns are they showing or not showing? So we can then connect the timing of the motor patterns to the expression of them in the adults. Um, and then finally, when they're pups, we're also going to be taking saliva swabs. This is so we can look at their genetics. And then we can say, are there any genes that are associated with both the expression of that motor pattern in the adult and the timing of the onset of that motor pattern in the pup, allowing us to, to see if there's any genes that possibly are um, associated with this and could be candidates for controlling or, or having effect on this behavior. So in conclusion, uh, working lines have a diverse expression of ancestral motor patterns. These motor patterns are first expressed during the critical period in play, and we hypothesize that earlier expression will lead to inclusion in the adult repertoire. And finally, we're going to be testing this hypothesis and anybody who's listening who would be interested in participating with their pups or uh, adults, um, it probably won't happen right away, but we're hoping in the next year. Um, please do feel free to contact me and let me know and I'll put you on the list and let you know when we're getting started with this. Um, and so with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Well, folks, if you've got questions, uh, go ahead and post those in the chat for Dr. Lord. Thank you, volunteers, for watching the videos. So, yes, um, so for the videos, um, anybody will be able to participate in that. We are going to create, it's going to be, it's not going to be actually an app, but a website. And so basically we're going to be doing citizen science with that. So 
anybody who wants to watch those videos will be able to sign up. You'll go through a very brief training. Um, basically, I'll have coded some of the videos. And so it'll be a few videos where you have to hit that you saw the behavior when it happened and not hit it when you didn't. And then you will be let loose on the videos of the uh, the different pups. And you just have to hit the button when you see it. If We might set it up also that if you get good enough, we'll let you do more behaviors or frequency or something like that as well. We haven't quite decided. We'll have to see how well it goes, but absolutely. Um, to sign up to participate with your litter, um, just send me an email to that address that's on the screen right now that you are interested in and, and how you are interested, you know, that you are, that you produce livestock guarding dog pups, that you have livestock guarding dogs and would be interested if you got, once you got a pup that you had an adult, you'd be interested in filling out questionnaires, um, whatever it is, um, let me know and I will put you on a list and get in touch with you as soon as we get started. Uh, the website for the actual um, coding of the pups is not up yet, but I will definitely um, let Bill know when it is, so maybe he can post it somewhere so that you can see it, or you can write me my email and let me know that you're interested in when it is up and I can try to let you know that too as well. Um, okay, uh, I hope I'm not skipping any. Uh, how do LGD fit into this equation that never adjust and attack stock? Ah, okay, so um, when you have, um, there's a couple different things that could be going on with livestock guarding dogs that are showing these motor patterns. So. Um, sometimes, uh, if, if we're right with this hypothesis and you get the later that these motor patterns show up, the less likely they're being included in the sequence, you could have these motor patterns show up late, but be in, um, in a livestock guarding dog, but they're in a situation where they can express them. So they're already in with the livestock because they're being socialized with them. And all of a sudden chase shows up and they start chasing around the livestock. So ideally what you do at that point is remove them from that situation temporarily so that they couldn't express that motor pattern for a while, um, probably until the end of the critical period. Hopefully it's very close to that point um, when it shows up so it wouldn't take very long and then reintroduce them to the stock when they're no longer chasing um, because you wouldn't want them to include that motor pattern into the sequence. Um, as adults, once if they've if this is already something that's fixed, I'm less useful in helping you with that problem <laughs> because this is really about the development of that behavior. Once it's already developed um, and they have it, it's become rewarding, and now that's more of a training question. Um, ideally, you don't want it to develop in the first place. Also, if you're having that motor pattern show up very early probably not a good animal to breed for future livestock um, because it is so heritable. We'd expect that their pups would also have an early expression of say chase or grab bite or whatever it is that's showing up. So if you can't get rid of it in a dog by removing them um, and, and it's that early and it's just gonna show up no matter what you do, that's not gonna be a great livestock guarding dog. Interestingly, this is also why um, people have found in um, very hot climates, um, so most of our well, our land race breeds are big animals who are doing transhumance migrations up into mountains. And so they're very large and have a lot of fur. But um, because these free living dogs tend not to have these motor patterns, they also end up being, if you get them young enough, good livestock guarding dogs. And so oftentimes um, they'll be used in Africa, for example, several of them uh, will be used as livestock guarding dogs because they're smaller. Um, and so you need a bunch of them, but um, they do much better in the climate. And of course, if they're native to the area, you don't have to worry about diseases and things killing them off. Uh, adult food dogs that attack stock through a fence. Yeah, fences are interesting. Um, so if you, for example, have a dog that's not a livestock riding dog, but say a, a border collie that does have these motor patterns and you introduce a fence, um, it can really do strange things to the expression of the motor patterns. So if you have um, a border collie raised with ducks through a fence, they have trouble um, latching on with eye. Um, because they, because the darn fence keeps interrupting them. So, so the eye, but then they can't chase and it gets kind of weird with a, with a livestock guarding dog, you have, um, you have this sort of 
weird situation where now you have a barrier. Um, and, and so it's probably not the same. I'm trying to think this through as I say it, I guess I'd have to see it, but it might not be the same trigger because a lot of times fences will induce um, different different behaviors because of that barrier being there. Um, so that's an interesting an interesting problem if they're only doing it through a fence and not doing it when they're out in uh, contact with them. I'd expect that wasn't act that might not actually be predatory behavior. It might be uh, something else going on like. Um, uh, fence fighting type stuff, which is uh, different. Yeah, like a barrier reaction. Yeah, I I think that might be something else, not predatory behavior. Um, LGD grab biting a fellow guardian dog enough to injure them. Ouch. Um, so so um, that you would expect to be problematic as well. Uh, that. There is this fact of context. So um, for example, if you have a very bitey pup who's not a livestock guarding dog, that you, um, who's, you know, biting hands and feet and clothes, it is possible to redirect that behavior to another context, right? Like toys and, and things like that. And the same is true in other animals as well, like livestock guarding dogs, that you could have a motor pattern and have it not directed towards the sheep, but towards other things. But you'd expect if the livestock guarding dog had it, the sheep tend to be great targets for that sort of thing. So I'd expect that wouldn't be great for, for the sheep either. But um, biting other dogs to the point where they're injuring them is actually has to do with not the expression, uh, not the expression of the behavior I've been talking about it, uh, that I've been talking about, but rather the, um, the intensity of the bite itself. And so they just, they aren't, they aren't pulling their punches, so to speak. So, um, you can get a soft mouth dog, like in a retriever, they really like dogs with a very soft mouth. And so they don't break the, the bird that they're picking up. They don't want them to smush them to little bits. They want them just picking up very gently. Um, that sort of thing tends to be learned very early with siblings. Um, so if they're raised with uh, without siblings, you'll often get a dog who doesn't know how to inhibit their bite and they just bite as hard as they possibly can. Um, usually they learn it naturally with their siblings because their siblings will scream and go away when they bite that hard. Um, but they can also learn a bit later that it's okay as well, even if they have siblings, that they they just aren't getting um, the feedback that they're biting too hard. Um, so, so there's sort of two things going on there. <laughs> one is that they have grab bite, which I'd expect wouldn't be wonderful in the Livestock Guardian. And two is that they have no bite inhibition, which is not great for the other dog. <laughs> um, Dr. Lord, just out of curiosity, are, are some of these behaviors that, that folks were mentioning today, could they be caused because you know, the, a pup was purchased or picked up too young, um, like shortly after weaning, like maybe at six weeks instead of waiting, you know, a couple more weeks until around eight yeah, weeks. You had time cer to, yeah, certainly the bite inhibition can be because they aren't around enough dogs when they're young. Um, that can definitely happen. Um, it could be that or it can be that they're a singleton or um, uh, only a couple pups in the litter. But yeah, if, if they're taken from the litter too soon, that is one of the things that they learn from their litter mates. So um, bite inhibition is definitely that and just being around other dogs in the first place in an appropriate manner in general. <laughs> Well, does anyone else have any more questions for Dr. Lord? Oh, there we go. Maybe I'm raising a singleton. Uh, singletons are always so hard. Uh, I think you want them to be around the the stock as much as possible, um, as as soon as they can be, and use them as the siblings. Since hopefully you won't have any of those motor patterns showing up, and they won't be um, gnawing on them or playing with them the way they would. Um, you know, way a standard pup would with their siblings. Um, so, um, yeah, I would think that singletons are always tricky. I think all this guardians, the one being bit is the youngest. Uh, yeah, 
you can also get in siblings. In siblings, you can get some kind of crummy behaviors that they learn with each other as well. So um, the biting really hard could have been something that he learned in that specific situation was he could get away with with the smaller of the siblings. A lot of times when you have uh, two pups and one is bigger than the other, the big one does tend to bully the little one. Um, either that or the little one then gets so <laughs> ramped up that they end up being kind of a Napoleon complex. <laughs> light of day effect, oops, is the light of day effect a sequence because they've seen chase, but after dark, oh, after dusk, that could be, that. I'm guessing here, this is a hypothesis, but um, I wouldn't think it would be so much the time of day, but it might have to do with the stimulus that they're getting. So the threshold is increased by seeing something they're only seeing when it's dim out. So just that like mysterious movement in the dark might be making the stimulus a bit more intense than it would be when they could see really well. And so I'm guessing you have a threshold cross right there where it's just like, oh, we're normally under threshold, but this is just big enough that it's pushing them over the, the cusp. Um, I have a great LGD female that was raised here on my farm. She was in a litter of eight. The other pups left at 12 weeks. She's perfect, but she does exhibit eye stalking towards intruders. Is there a difference? Yeah. So that's the context thing. So you, you thankfully do not have her doing it towards the sheep. Um, probably because she was social or, or goats or whatever it is, um, but probably because she was socialized well with them, but she maybe didn't get as much human socialization with strangers. And so she's exhibiting it towards them instead. Um, so, so it's still eye stock. It's still a predatory behavior. Um, hopefully that's all that she has. And so you don't get chased and graphite as well. <laughs> it should be a little more of a problem. Is there a way to lower prey dive in an adult dog? What would the steps be? Yeah, so that then is going to go into training. Once they're adults, you can no longer take advantage of this um, development that I've been talking about, this natural um, progression. Really, you can only do that when they're younger. Sometimes even in livestock guarding dogs, the motor pattern shows up so late, it's like an adolescence. Adolescence is a second critical period. So same thing there, you can just remove them. Um, don't let them show it towards the sheep and then put them back in. But, um, but if they're fully adults and they have it, then they have it. And now it's a matter of training, which is another whole nother thing. Ideally, you don't want them to have the prey drive in the first place. Um, and that, um, and that would avoid that problem. But once, if you have it in the adult, then that's, then that's, um, another problem that you'd need, you need to train away. Um, I, I'm not sure if you can, if you can get them to be, um, reliable or not at that point. Um, I suspect it would be very difficult. but somebody might have some strategy, not me. Well, those are the calls that I get about the, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> so if you're having issues Talk folks, with some of these things um, <laughs> you know, in, in teenage dogs or adult dogs, um, feel free to contact me here at the center. I'll be more than happy to try to give you some suggestions on uh, ways to um, at least slow down some of these predatory behaviors uh, that happen in, in teenage dogs. And sometimes we can be fairly successful at correcting them, not 100%, but we can lower them quite a bit. Yeah, I'd expect in the teenagers especially, you'd be able to have some effect at that point. They're definitely um, still, still developing then. <laughs> the chain of shame, not great chase. Yeah, not being able to chase, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. A lot of the same ideas work in adolescence with the livestock guarding dogs, um, just because it's all shifted so late in them, we think. Um, so, so it would make sense not allowing them to do it then would, would get rid of it. I guess I'll just throw this one in there, folks, for everybody. Um, I would strongly encourage you to buy from a good, reputable breeder. Um, you know, the, the inexpensive or free livestock guardian dog puppy that you get is not necessarily always the best one because uh, you're probably going to be calling me, you know, <laughs> in a few months with, with some issues. Um, so, um, oh, yeah, I, I recently just kind of 
quickly here for everybody. Uh, you know, I had a lady contact me. She was having some issues with her livestock guardian dog, and she swore that that dog was a pure livestock guardian dog. And we kept going round and round. And finally, I was like, look, I think you need to just send me some pictures of this dog. Sure enough, as soon as I see it, it's all like speckled and it's got like a black eye and ears didn't look right. Yeah. Uh, somebody sold her a border collie mixed. Oh right yeah. That's not going to work. <laughs> and so again, I, you know, buy from a reputable breeder. Um, please, please, please. It does matter. It does matter. Um, yeah. That early, that early rearing too is super yes. important that they do for them as well. So, so both the genetics and that early behavior that you're going to get from a good, a good livestock breeder is going to be so much better than a, I just out of nowhere dog. <laughs> uh, do we have another question? Um, oh, I missed it. Yes. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Hello. Okay. Um, in buying a puppy, what age would you recommend it being bought from the breeder? I'll let Bill answer. I mean, I would expect you'd want to get him at no earlier than eight, but uh, Bill, do you have preferences on that? Yeah. Again, I, I agree with you, Dr. Lord. Uh, we try to get our pups at, at eight weeks. Um, a lot of times <clears throat> the, the females, um, especially when it's warmer, will, you know, wean a little bit early at six weeks, but you know, a lot of these behaviors that Dr. Lord has talked about today can be, you know, discouraged in those pups if they're left with their siblings and their mother uh, until eight weeks of age. And so um, we don't see a lot of these behaviors that everybody talks about in our dogs. And I, it's not because we have something special here. But again, we buy from reputable breeders. We pick up all our puppies right at the eight week mark and they go straight into a bonding pen with livestock. Um, so that, that would be my recommendation is it, you know, not eight weeks. But in, in the, we raise on section pastures and going into a bonding pen is very difficult because we're only lambing once a year. And in the section, the acreage that the, these animals go to, I'm going, thanks a lot. <laughs> kind of like, I need help. Uh, because the puppy would come from East Texas. We had gotten, we've gotten um, one, I don't know if it's four or six, and I've had, I've lost all of them except one, two. And one is out there with the sheep now, and he was about six months old when the wife brought him up, but she brought him with an, a younger puppy. And this rascal is a different breed. It, I say the breed wrong. His name is Grimper, but I guess the breed is Gumper or Gamper. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And he's had to have a PVC collar pipe put on him because he would go around chasing or crawling under fences everywhere. And he cannot get out of the pen that he's in. He's in with two ewes and three lambs that have to stay at the house. Um, but there was one time when I had three others there in the same area that he was chasing them and he got tied up every night, but those three were sold and he doesn't chase these others. So it leaves me in a lot of confusion of one, what do I do when an animal of, uh, eight months old is chasing but he stopped chasing when the others left. Two, I was in San Antonio for surgery and happened to go see this breeder. And there was one puppy that I adored. And that was, uh, she was probably about four weeks old, the latter part of June. So I am caught of what would I do with this puppy and bring her out because we will be weaning within a month and what do I bond her with? I'm giving you a lot of questions. <laughs> um oh I feel free to jump in here, Dr. Lord. Um I I don't I don't think this is outside of the um the scope of the talk, I'm afraid, but but I don't know if Bill might be able to help you at, at some point. 
Yes, ma'am. Feel free. I've to, enjoyed uh, your talk very much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, ma'am, if you'd like to just feel free to give me a, a call here at the center. Um, I can give you my phone number real quick. I, I have it, Bill. I have it okay. on a piece of paper here. This is Deb Jones. Oh, okay. Yeah, just give me a holler back and uh, I can help you out with some more of that stuff uh, specifically. Okay, because what she, the talk that she gave um, was intermingling. I, I like the one comment in particular in that uh, if they are chasing, basically it is genetic. And I'm going... You don't want to breed that one to anything because of the genetics that, that are there. Yeah, I, I can I can help you out more if you give me a call here a little in a little while. That'll be fine. Thank you. You're welcome, hey. ma'am. Bye bye. I think there's another question for you, Doctor Lord. Oh, yeah. Uh, oops. So much work to train. What is the best time of year to get and introduce a new LGD, how long is the introduction to last and how do we support the natural sequence? I'm not exactly sure, or, or is the sequence already in there before we introduce? Ah, um, so hopefully you don't have any of the sequence. Um, and yes, you'd expect if you were um, getting the pup at eight weeks or later that that critical period has pretty much passed. Although, as I mentioned, in livestock guarding dogs, it can show up after eight weeks, um, as late as adolescence. Um, and the um, the idea is that the breeder will have had them in with livestock already. Um, and so that will also help with the whole um, making sure that they're okay with the um, the livestock that is a little bit more of what I talked about in the last talk, but, um, but it is important that they get that experience during that critical period with the livestock. Um, and they would probably also, if they saw any of these, these motor patterns need to take the pup out temporarily, but it's pretty rare in a, in a good line of, of livestock guarding dogs to see it early. I hope that answered the question. <laughs> Well, Kara, if that didn't answer your question, feel free to post some more in the chat here. So there is a way to test for the lack of drive, but it could get it later. Yeah, so, so um, you'd expect, you'd hope not to see anything at eight weeks, you'd hope not to see any of the motor patterns. There is a possibility to show up later, but if it shows up later, it should be pretty easy to get rid of, um, as opposed to it showing up before eight weeks. If it shows up before eight weeks, it's going to be harder to get rid of. Um, if it's right at the eight week line, that might be okay. But if you're seeing it at like five weeks, that's that's not good. <laughs> that should be a bit of a red flag. Um, so yeah, but if you haven't seen it at eight weeks, it's totally possible it'll show up all the way up to adolescence. But if it does, it's much easier to get rid of at that point. It should be it should be uh, pretty standard to get rid of if you're if it's popping up out towards adolescence or late or sometime in between that and eight weeks. Um, that should be dealable. <laughs> we should be able to handle that. <laughs> uh, it's How not so much. It's not so much discipline. Um, I'll let Bill give you the details. I think he has some nice actual strategies, but the, the larger overarching idea is that you're not allowing them to perform those behaviors towards the livestock by removing them from the situation temporarily or uh, inhibiting them somehow, um, making it not possible for them to perform those behaviors temporarily until they stop. Um, but I think Bill has some nice actual usable strategies that he can give you, which go along with that idea. But the basic idea is that as the motor pattern turns on, if they're using it, they're gonna and they enjoy it, they'll keep using it. So if it shows up late, it's pretty easy to interrupt and just be like, nope, you can't use that one, in which case it doesn't get sequenced in and it drops back out of the out of the sequence and they just stop using it again. Um, so if you can catch it then and it's late, then it should be fine. If it's early, if it's during that critical period and they're running around chasing sheep, 
at you know five weeks when they're being first introduced to them, that's no good. That's that's not going to go well. That's one of your border collie Pyrenees crosses. That's going to be awful. It's no, it's not a good livestock riding dog. Stop. <laughs> Um, so introducing to the dog prior to putting it in the herd is introduction to the dog prior to putting in the herd is a priority. Uh, I'm not sure what the yes he does is, but, uh, yeah, knowing, knowing, I mean, I would think having a good breeder would also be a good way around that. I think if you could have a trusted breeder, they'd, they'd know this stuff too. So, um, but yeah, knowing if they, if they're showing that stuff early on would be valuable. Uh, Bill has great strategies. Yes, he has great oh, strategies. Okay. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> yeah. So if you want some more actionable strategies on how to do that sort of thing, if it's showing up later, um, yeah, chat with Bill. You're welcome. <laughs> great. Well, folks, any more? Quick questions here. I don't want to uh, take up too much of Dr. Lord's time today. Well, I think we'll we'll wrap it up here, Dr. Lord. Great. Uh, Thank you very much. <laughs> well, I sure appreciate you coming out uh, and taking some time again to um, present for us. Um, I'll, again, I do want to thank our sponsor for today, Lone Star Tracking. As always, um, they're a great company to work with if you're looking for some GPS trackers. And then uh, I want to thank the Sheep and Goat Predator Management Board again for our funding and Dr. Redden, the, the center director here. And so with that, uh, our next webinar will be the third Thursday in November, as always. Um, and uh, you can check out our Facebook event page and uh, we'll have some more information as that one gets a little bit closer. Uh, it will be on a specific livestock guardian dog breed. Um, I just can't remember uh, who we have scheduled at, at this point in time. So anyway, <laughs> well, thank you again, Dr. Lord. And uh, thank you everybody for logging in today. We sure do appreciate your support. Y'all have a good day. Thanks.